you're visiting here today, we're really glad to have you. Last week we started a fall emphasis, we call it Make a Difference, and this month will be Make a Difference in your life, next month in your family's life, the next month in the community's life, and we'll finish the Saturday before Thanksgiving and do an a outbound experience where we're praying for 2,000 people ought to meet together and go out and do ministry in Jesus' name. And your bulletin tells you what's going on. I noticed something in there, one of my favorite classes that we teach here every semester because it makes such a huge difference in people's lives is the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. And I looked at that, and I normally don't give shout-outs because we have 350 different groups and classes going, but that one, if you've got financial troubles, go there. It's wonderful. It'll change your life. They pay off about $300,000 of personal debt every semester when they get together and do that. So praise the Lord for Dave. He's taking the Bible's financial principles and making them real in people's lives, and that's good. Uh, I taught you last week two dances, the Texas Two-Step. I had a doctor from New York that thanked me because he'd always heard about it and didn't know how, so now he does. It's not a complicated dance. And then the CBC four-step, which was join, grow, discover, serve. Join as in join Jesus, join the church, and join a ministry. And last week, the Lord blessed us. It was a wild weekend. I got in on Monday, and they said, well, we had 87 new believers and 800 new members join CBC last week. So... That's pretty awesome. Now, some of them had been here 14 or 15 years, and I thank you for not rushing into a commitment, (laughs) thinking through it and seeing everything there is to see. (laughs) And then grow, how to grow spiritually. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, and I'll show you how to have that abundant life today. Then discover your shape, S-H-A-P-E is an acronym for your spiritual gift, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. Now, sometime today, between now and next week, I want you to go to our website, communitybible.com, click on that red thing that says personality and gifts test, and take it. It's about 45 minutes long. It's free. Anybody can take it, teenagers, but you answer all these questions, adults, and it'll spit out as soon as you finish it kicks out, you know, you, who you are, your personality, your gifts, your leadership style. It's really good. I looked at mine again last night just to make sure it was still me. <laughs> and it is. I read it. And I thought, man, this is really a great test. So next week we'll talk about that, but you can get a head start if you will figure out your shape. You go there, take it, and you'll learn it. And then the week after that, last week of September, is serve. Find a need in the world and fill it. Find a hurt in the world and heal it. Now, if you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 6, and we'll learn how to grow spiritually. How many of you would like to have that a life that Jesus promised? You can have life more abundantly. If you like that, say, I would. Okay. If you're miserable and hate your life where you're at, but you want to stay there, that's great. We'll be out in 30 minutes, and uh, you can go on about your life. But If you want to grow spiritually, if you want to learn that life, it's not automatic. It doesn't happen just because you trust Jesus. you got to trust Jesus and read the Bible and do what it says, and that's what makes a difference. Now, I'm going to give you some ideas this morning that I promise you, if you put them into practice, you will begin to grow spiritually. Not just once a week, not just once a month, not just when you come to church, but when you plant a seed in your backyard, that thing's growing every day, every night. It's always in that growing process. And when God plants salvation in your heart, it's not just Sunday at 11 o'clock that it grows, but it's all day, at night, it's through experiences, the good and the bad. God is growing you up. You say, what's he growing me up for? He's growing you for a life in eternity in the kingdom of heaven. This is sort of a training ground for that next life that we'll be a part of. So growing spiritually is really important. Now, the first thing is pray more. Let me hear you say pray more. Everybody prays. You've prayed. I've prayed. Everybody, even atheists pray. Sooner or later, everybody calls on the Lord for help on a test or save them out of a battle in in military or help them find a maid or heal somebody. Everybody prays. Here is the short definition of prayer. Prayer is people talking to God. Prayer is people talking to God. Now, everybody has their methods and their ways. Jesus teaches us what he wants us to know about prayer. It's in Matthew chapter 6. Now, verses 5 through 8, he gives a few few short one-liners. Let me give them to you, and then we'll go to the meat of it. Number one, he says, don't be a show-off prayer. 
you know, show off prayer, how, you know, you go around the circle, and everybody prayed, 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 and then one person, oh, God Almighty, the great Jehovah. And I mean, it sounds like a sermon. It is a sermon. It's not a prayer unless that person says, Robert, it's so good to see you today, and I want to go to lunch with you and learn more about your life. Okay, if you talk like that, way to go. But, uh, but for most of us, prayer, just like you talk to people, husband, wife, family, friends, you talk to God that way. You don't have to register down in a lower octave. You don't have to go back into King James English. You just talk in English. Jesus said, don't be a show-off when you pray. And he said, pray privately. Now, we do have public prayers, and we do that here and everywhere. You do that as part of ministry. But Jesus said, what I really want you to do is get in private and talk to me. In your closet, on your knees by your bed, driving down your car. Get alone privately and say, Lord, here's what's going on, and I need your help. He said, for you, when you pray in private, your heavenly Father sees that and rewards you openly. And then he said, don't repeat your prayers over and over. Prayer is not about rote sayings, the same old thing over and over and over. He said, other religions do that. Jesus called it babbling on and on. He said, don't do that. Your Father in heaven already knows what you need before you ask Him. And then here's what Jesus teaches us. Look at verse 9. He said, pray like this. Matthew 6, 9, pray like this. Or New King James Version says, in this manner, therefore pray. New Living Translation, pray like this. Repeat after me, pray like this. No, the emphasis has got to be the like. Pray like this. There you go. You say, what's the big deal? Because Jesus said, pray like this, not pray this. The Lord's Prayer, everybody, most of us memorize it. And if you haven't, I recommend you do because it is fantastic. But Jesus never said, pray this. He said, pray like this. It is a model. It is a guide. It is something to help us go forward. And it's, it's the areas of prayer that Jesus wants us to focus on. Now, I say the Lord's Prayer almost every morning. I roll out of bed or actually I sit up and let the blood rush to my feet. And I go through the Lord's Prayer. First, I say it, but it's not like there. I've prayed, but it just gets me focused on the Lord. And then I go through that prayer. Whenever I pray and it's a long, you know, extended time with the Lord, I work my way through the Lord's Prayer. Let me show you how. Let's put it up verse at a time. In this manner, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Then you stop and you thank God for all of he's done. God of creation. He's the God who heals. He's the God who sees everything that's going on. He's the God that comforts us. He's the God that counsels us. He's Lord God Almighty. And so you take time and honor him there. And it says, your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This part of the prayer reminds us that it's God's plan, not ours, and that we are the sheep of his pasture. He's not the God of our pasture. He's got something going on, and we want to get in on his plan. We're not trying to get God in on our plan. But most of us start our prayer life out trying to get God in on our plan, kind of like the magic genie, Lord, I need a help. You know, how about now? But when you pray this prayer and it's the model and you go from it, you realize it's God's plan, not mine. And that's what we always need to be reminded of. Next verse. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, Jesus isn't saying just pray for bread and that's it. It's this part of the prayer that says you've got needs in your life. You've got wants. You've got needs. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So you let your request be made known unto the Lord. Most of us don't need any more daily bread. We got a pantry full of it already. So what is he saying? He's saying pray for your needs, your food, shelter, clothing, education, medication, relationships, friends, healing, whatever's going on in your life. This is where you say, Lord, I'm hurting right now. Lord, I need a job. I need a relationship. I'm going through a divorce. I've lost the love of my life. Whatever it is, you ask God, this is what I need, and you pour out your requests unto the Lord. Next verse. And forgive us our debts or our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, the first half of that verse is really great. The second half, I don't care for much. First half says, Lord, forgive me my sins. Now, how many of you are Christians already say, I am? Amen. Your sins are already forgiven. Jesus did it all on the cross, so that forgiveness is already there. So why is Jesus saying, Lord, forgive me for my sins? It's not that he doesn't know your sins, but he wants you to stop and acknowledge that you do have areas in your life that need improvement. You do have things you've done against God. So when you pray, most of us, we pray and we confess the usual sins. Lord, forgive me for my impatience. That's a nice, safe one. 
Lord, forgive me for being a little irritable. That's a nice, safe one. But we leave those really ugly sins away. We don't leave, like we're hiding something from God. Like he doesn't see that. Oh, no, don't know. He knows everything. He sees everything. He sees you wherever you are. Every sin you've ever committed, past, present, and future, God already knows about. So why are we praying? Because he wants us to acknowledge our shortcomings. When you realize you've sinned against God, Lord, I'm reading your word and it says to do this and I haven't done that. Forgive me. Lord, it says not to do this. I've been doing that. Forgive me. We're acknowledging with God where we stand with him. So we're not hiding anything. Next verse. Oh, uh, for, I forgot the other second half of that. Go back. As we forgive our sin, those who sin against us. Okay, enough said there. Uh, that's a tough one. This is the only part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus reiterated. If you don't forgive others for their sins against you, then neither will God forgive you for your sins against Him. That's serious stuff. That's serious stuff. It means, Lord, you forgive me. Thank you. But then the Lord says, and uh, you got a part in this prayer. And you say, Lord, I forgive so-and-so for this they did against me. Now, this is the most hypocritical part of the Lord's Prayer for us. Because we'll do it. We'll say it out of obedience. Lord, I forgive John for what he did, or I forgive my, my ex-wife for divorcing me, or my ex-husband for taking the kids, or whatever. Lord, I forgive them. I'm saying it, but I don't mean it. It is hard to forgive. I deal with people almost every week when, when we get to the forgiveness thing, and they're bitter and angry, and that person that abused them or hurt them did something bad, they just can't get over that forgiveness thing. And I ask them, are you working towards it? Well, I'm trying to, but I'm not there yet. Great. Long as you're trying to, you're going in the right direction. Eventually, you get there days, weeks, months, years later, maybe with Scripture, maybe with prayer, maybe with counseling, but you learn when that person comes to your mind and the flesh goes, Ugh. the Spirit goes, I forgive them just as the Lord has forgiven me. And Lord, I pray you'd bless them wherever they are, whoever they're with, bless them in whatever way you want to. And then the next one. Do not lead us in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Stop right there, that period. Everybody's got a sin. How many of you know the sin that so easily entangles you? Raise your hand. Oh, come on. Don't lie. Think about it. I know it's a trick. Fast question. Now that you've thought about it, that one thing you really just struggle with. Now, raise your hand if you know what it is. Okay. Jesus said, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Not that he leads us into it, but basically it's, Lord, this is an area of my life that I struggle with. Today, this day, guide me away from the temptations, the people, the places, or the things that would cause me to do those things. Deliver us from the evil one. Satan, it's a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And then he said, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a reminder that there's an eternity waiting for us. And because you know Jesus, you get to be a part of that kingdom. That's how you pray the Lord's Prayer. That's how you use that prayer. Now, Jesus modeled prayer for us. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for us in John 17. He prayed for the lost. He prayed for the saved. He prayed for all kinds of things. But the absolute best example of a prayer life I have ever seen, I just discovered this week. In the Bible, the best model for a prayer life. You know, I'm always thinking Abraham, Moses, you know, David, Solomon, Jesus, the disciples and all of that. The best example of a prayer life ever is the disciples and their relationship with Jesus. Let me explain. What is prayer? It's people talking to, one more time, prayer is people talking to God. Jesus was God on earth. Is that correct? So if Jesus was God on earth, then every conversation the disciples had with Jesus technically was prayer because they were talking to God. It's amazing when you start looking at the disciples' conversations with Jesus and you start thinking, looking at them from the perspective of prayer, you go, wow, they covered everything. They, they had questions for Jesus. He answered them. He had questions for them. He answered them. They were with him morning, noon, and night. The Bible says pray without ceasing. So they were conversing with Jesus all the time. 
They had their doubts. They had their fears, and Jesus accepted those. They had their moments where they were self-centered and selfish. We have our prayers that are self-centered and selfish. They had their moments where they were scared to death, and Jesus calmed them down. We have our moments when we're scared, and Jesus calms us down. They had their moments of weakness and failure, and Jesus helped them through it. They had their moments of vengeance. A couple of them, because the group rejected Jesus, they said, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them up? Jesus kind of calmed them down. No, no, we're not here to burn people up. Just chill out. Vengeance. I love that part of the prayer. Let me show you the, the spiritually mature way to pray for vengeance. Lord, vengeance is yours. I simply ask that you make me the instrument of your wrath. <laughs> they were always talking to Jesus. Now, in your prayer life, you're always communicating. Prayer isn't on the, in the morning on your knees only. It's driving. It's walking. When you think and you're thinking towards God, prayer, you're praying. When you whisper, you're praying. When you speak, you're praying. When you write your prayers, you're praying. When you sing your prayers, you're praying. When you say the Lord's Prayer, and it's not just a rote experience, but you actually slow down and you go, Lord, I mean this, and you work your way through it, it's prayer. When you say, Lord, help me, it's prayer. When you say, Lord, help them, it's prayer. You pray without ceasing. That's the way he wants us. That's how you grow spiritually, and you can do it. I mean, you text without ceasing. <laughs> your phone's always on, so think of your phone and texting as communicating with God. Prayer is you and I talking to God. Studying His Word is God talking to us. Pray without ceasing. The other day, I was off, and I went to the Rolling Oaks Mall during the day, uh, Friday, and nobody was there. And I, you know, pray as I go, and I walk in, and you know, I just prayed, Lord, show me who I'm supposed to help or encourage while I'm here today. And I walked around the mall, walked to one in, one of the, saw a sign up, said the Simon Youth Foundation. What is that? Started reading, still didn't know what it was. As I walked the mall, I saw where it was, and I saw Simon Youth Foundation. I went in, just curious, and a receptionist, I said, what is the Simon Youth Foundation? She said, excuse me? And I didn't look like I do today. I had shorts and flip-flops on, so I didn't look as godly as I do this moment. <laughs> and I said, well, what, what is this place? What do you all do? And about that time, a lady comes around the cubicle. She said, I recognize that voice. Robert, what are you doing here? And I go, hey. <laughs> now, if I ever do that to you, it means I don't quite remember how we're connected. But you're obviously knowing me, so hey. I know you. People say, I go to your church. I know I see you every week. <laughs> she said, I'm Angie, and I, I love the church. She said, actually, I go to Chris's one o'clock service, but you're good too. <laughs> I said, well, what is this? And she gives me the grand tour. I mean, it was a you know, just she teaches English here. She's been there 17 years, introduces me around to everybody, talks to people that haven't been to church. And she said, this is the guy that swings on the rope and brings rattlesnakes on stage and breaks fences and has his dog, had his dog on stage. And uh, the people start talking. I asked her, I said, do you remember the lessons that go with all those illustrations? She said, no, but they were really good. <laughs> so we visited and I left. And I thank the Lord. I said, wow, I asked you to show me who needs encouraging, and I just stumbled into this place, and it happened. You pray as you go. You pray as you drive. You pray as you're in the waiting room. You pray as you're going through chemo. You pray if you're old and gray and can't move around too much. All I'm doing is laying in bed. Then as long as your mind is going, you be praying. Pray without ceasing. That's how you grow spiritually. Now, after you pray without ceasing and you're doing that, Jesus says to study his word. Let me show you in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. If you read Matthew 1 through 7, like we encourage all of our new believers to do, you'll find out who Jesus is, what he did, and what he taught, and how he wants us to live. He, Sermon on the Mount, he covers anger, marriage, vows, giving, money, prayer, do, walk, the, going the extra mile, the uh, golden rule, all those, the narrow road, they're all in there. And he finishes the Sermon on the Mount with verse 24, 724. Jesus said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on the solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on the bedrock. 
He's saying, you can follow me, trust me, read my word, put it into practice. You're still going to have storms in life. You're still going to go through things you don't want to go through. You're still going to get cancers or divorces or disasters or accidents. Things happen to everybody, Christian or not. But he said, when you study his word and you put it into practice, your house stands. And then he says, but if you come to me and you hear my words, but you don't obey them, then that's foolish. He said, when the storms come into your life, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus came that we might have life, we might have it more abundantly. The way you do that is you learn the life that he wants you to live. The way you do that is you study the Bible. There's three ways to study the Bible. You can go through book of the Bible, which I recommend. You can also go through topics of the Bible, you know, index and go through that. Or you can study people of the Bible. Those are the three best methods. Now, there's a fourth Bible study method. We don't recommend it, but we've all done it. It's what I call the kamikaze method. Where you just, Lord, show me something good today. Hope to hit something good. And you read it. Now, we don't, if you don't know what kamikazes are, you remember the magic eight ball used to, Lord, should I go out with this person? You know, decidedly so, and that sort of thing. <laughs> now, God, in his sense of humor and mercy and grace, allows you to dive in sometimes and actually go, wow, that was good. Now, look at me. How many of you have actually done that method? Just dive in, you hit it, and you go, wow, that was good stuff. Raise your hand, be honest. Okay. I rest my case. God in His mercy does so. If you're a couple today and you go home and, you know, you husband and wives, and you just say, let's just see what God tells us to do. And you open your Bible, and the man points his finger, and it says, and Peter said to the disciples, I'm going fishing. <laughs> man, what a great book. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's stay away from that method, and let's go to the ones, the books, the topics, and the people. Now, five things you can take pictures of, it. let me put it back up there. Number one, get a study Bible. Every study Bible is great. I have never read a study Bible that I did not love. Do not ever let any Christians put you down for your study Bible. Every study Bible is excellent. I got a bunch of them. I got a, a show full of them. I use them all. I get them. Publishers send them to me a lot because they want me to recommend them to you. But uh, they're all good stuff. A study Bible gives you background, explanations, maps, charts, lets you know what's going on. When you hear about Syria, you can look up Syria in your study Bible and find, wow, they've been around a long time, and it's an interesting battle. Study Bible I recommend most because uh, it's easy, it's, it's loaded with stuff. If you don't have one, get one. It's called the Life Application Study Bible, and I use a New Living Translation. Uh, it's easy to read. It always has applications, so I like it. But like I say, every study Bible is excellent. Whichever one you got, stay with it. It's a great one. Second idea, you get a study Bible, and here's what you do. Read the introduction. I've never preached this before, but I am now. Repeat after me. Read the introduction. Now, I know that should go without saying, but how many of you have never read the introduction to your Bible? Raise your hand. Okay. Put it down quickly. Didn't want to, but you saw everybody. So why read the introduction? Start with the table of contents. It will tell you everything there is to know about that Bible. It tells you the preface, who wrote it, who the editors are, because a lot of really smart people contributed to your study Bible. Find out who they are, their seminaries. I was reading through one of mine, and lo and behold, it was a professor I had in seminary. He was one of the contributors. So it'll tell you how to use that Bible. It'll tell you the translations and where they got it. So here's my promise to you. If you'll take 30 minutes and read the introductions to your study Bible, you will learn more in 30 minutes about your Bible than you will in 30 days of just jumping around saying, well, I wonder what that means and why is this here and how does this work? Introduction. Repeat. Read the introduction. If you've got an old worn out Bible, read the introduction and you'll go, wow, wish I'd have read this 12 years ago. Number three, start with Matthew. All the books of the Bible are great. I recommend Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament. If you're a Christian, you're in the New Covenant. So start with Matthew. God put it there for a reason. Start there. Number four, notice the big bold line. Never preach that before either, but put that on the screen. The big bold line. Every study Bible's got a big bold line or a little artistic squiggly or something. What does it mean? It simply means this. The stuff above the line is what God said. The stuff below the line is what smart people said. Above the line, God can't change it. Below the line, people, really smart people, learn a lot, but you can disagree with them at the bottom. On top, God, below, man. So that's a page out of the Life Application Study Bible. And then number four, or number five, 
pray. That's my acronym for Bible study. You pray. Lord, open my eyes to what you want me to see in your word today. You read. You start reading uh, chapter by chapter, book by book, but you read. You start reading it and you mark it. Studying is different than reading. Reading is what you do with a newspaper. And you can read the Bible and it's, you know, oh, that's good stuff. And that's good, but study is better. When you study it, you know, it's like landing and saying, marking this. You know, when we look to the Lord's Prayer and it says, pray like this, not pray this, I learned that because I studied the passage. You learn stuff when you stick around and, and break it down. So pray, read, and then apply. How does this work in my life? And then yearn, yearn for more. Lord, this is good stuff. You teach me how to be a better husband, wife, student, pastor, leader, employee, employer, whatever it is you do, God will teach you. That's how you study the Bible. I would challenge you, set aside five minutes a day at least to study your Bible. You say, well, that's not very much. No, it's not. But if it's more than you're doing now, we're going in the right direction. Five minutes a day. My deal with the Lord 20, 36 years ago was, Lord, I want to read your Bible five minutes a day, and I promise I will if you remind me. And it was pretty cool. I mean, I went to bed at one o'clock sometimes, and the Lord said, <clears throat> <clears throat> and I grab my Bible and just, you know, read five minutes. Now you say, well, that's just, uh, you know, you're just doing, yeah, I'm just doing that because I made a commitment to the Lord. That's a good thing. Read the Bible, study it. A chapter a day is a good thing. A page a day. When you go through those study notes, uh, usually the scripture and the, and the notes all are together. So it's not jumping around. I always encourage you to go through the books of the Bible. You'll learn the, the, the books, the topics, and the people as you go through it. So you pray more, you study the Bible. Instead of just reading it, you start making it your own. And then the third thing you do is you change one thing. Let me hear you say, change one thing. Change. Jesus said in Matthew 7, actually it's interesting, 721 if you got that. He said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. That's serious stuff. There's two billion people around the world that call themselves Christians because they were christened or catechized or went to Sunday school or something. If you ask them on a test, what religion are you? Well, I'm Christian. And they'll say, Lord, Lord. But Jesus said, not everyone who calls him Lord is going to heaven, but only those who actually do the will of God. So it's not enough just to say, Jesus, you're Lord of my life. Remember our prayer? You know, the moment you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, when you confess him as Lord, it means you're coming under him. It means you're doing what he says. So if you're a Christian and you're not in the habit of reading the Bible and saying, I need to change some things, then the Lord sent you here for this. Change one thing. Now, how many of you know one thing already that you know God wants you to change? Either something he wants you to stop or something he wants you to start. Raise your hand for a little exercise. Excellent. So we don't need to spend any time in prayer saying, Lord, show us something. He already has. Now we just need to say, Lord, help me change it. You change it by resisting it. You memorize scripture. If you're, if you're one of those that jumps into a conversation and gets angry in the middle of a conversation, you memorize John 1:19. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. For the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. You say, wow, you know that one really well. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> If profanity is one of your issues and every time you cuss, you just repeat Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth, but only words that are good for edification that it might bring encouragement to those who hear it. You say, when? You know that one well too. Yes, I do. <laughs> Whatever your issue is, God has spoken to it. And by his grace, he doesn't give you a whole chapter on your issue. He gives you a verse. And Jesus modeled for us in Matthew 4. You resist temptation by realizing it, confessing the Word of God, and resisting it in Jesus' name. Change one thing. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus covers one subject more than any other except prayer. And it's the subject of worry. Matthew 6, verse 25. Jesus said, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or clothes to wear. Life's more important than food and your body more important than clothes. Then he goes on to say how God takes care of the birds and the flowers. Then verse 34, so don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. How many of you know somebody with the gift of worrying? Raise your hand. And if it's a self-confession, that's all right. Worrying is a skill. 
It's a marketable skill. It's a good skill. How many of you are warriors yourself? Personally, you listen to love. Okay, wow, well, you've come to the right place today, but you don't come back. <laughs> you say, worrying's a skill? Yeah, you have the ability to look at one thing for a long time and think about every possible conceivable thing that could go wrong with that one thing and worry about it and care about it. And you have empathy because you think if you worry about it, it'll get better. It doesn't. That's a gift. <laughs> and as you study worry in your topical index in your study Bible, you say, where's that? Read the introduction. <laughs> It'll tell you right where that topical index is. You look up worry and you go through all those really great verses and stories because there's like 400 verses in the Bible that say, fear not, worry not. My favorite is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. And the God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. He says, quit being a worrier and become a warrior. Ooh, that's good stuff. I'm going to say that again because some of you, you're already texting your way out of here. <laughs> Go from being a worrier to a warrior. Still focus on that one thing. You're good at that already. Still look at it from every conceivable situation. But as you do, instead of going, huh, you say, Lord, you're able, you're powerful. I pray that you would protect them, that you give them wisdom, you give them knowledge, you stop them from doing that. Lord, heal them. Lord, call them to heaven. Whatever it is God is, is doing, you pray for that. And your first prayer as a warrior and becoming a warrior is, Lord, thank you that 95% of the things I have worried about all of my life never happened. And now... Let me focus on the things that are right. If you're a warrior, become a warrior. If you're a, a substance abuser, then do less this week than you did last week. You say, well, shouldn't I quit altogether? Yes, one step at a time. If I can get you to dump it today, praise the Lord, but it's a progress thing. If you're angry or envious or bitter or unforgiving, Lord, today, let me have forgiveness. If you're a critical spirit and you like finding something wrong with everybody, go one day. Actually, let's make it easy. Go one hour without running anybody down or speaking negatively about anybody. That changes your life. When you start taking God's Word, reading it, make it your own, and living it, it changes your life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. None of those who followed Jesus said, you know what, this is miserable. This is getting worse by the day. I'm out of here. If Christianity didn't work, if Jesus didn't give you the power to change your life, if it didn't give you the ability to make your marriage better, your parenting better, your studenting better, your working better, then we wouldn't be here today. We just, ah, forget it. It doesn't work. But it works. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. How do you do that? The Bible says this in Romans 10, 9. It says, the moment you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, means he's in, in charge of your life from now on. The moment you do that, you confess that He is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. With your heart, you believe and are made right. With your mouth, you confess, and you are saved. Now, I need to see all of you looking around. That dog that barked is a working dog, okay? <laughs> Something upset him. Calm down. You know, I know you're, well, there's a dog in here. <laughs> We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's why the dog barked during the salvation part and not during the jokes. <laughs> so there's a battle going on, and if there was an ugly demon, you go, ooh, that's scary. But if it's a dog barking, you just don't pay attention. Listen to me again. Zero in, eyes. <laughs> the moment you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. That begins your new journey, your forgiveness that abundant life that He offers you. If you want that, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of salvation. All the believers will pray it together. If you pray it and you mean it, nothing magical about the words, but if you say, I'm ready to make that decision, I'm ready to follow Jesus, then pray it and mean it, and this is your moment of salvation. Let's pray. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Believers, say it with me, and anybody in the room ready to say, I want Jesus in my life, here's what we say together. Lord Jesus, today I trust you. I accept your forgiveness for all my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word. And help me to live for you. Thank you for my salvation.
As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, that's what the Bible says to do. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it and you'd say, this is my day, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says this in all three Gospels. He said, if you acknowledge him before people, he will acknowledge you before God. If you pray that prayer and you meant it today, and you know this is your day of salvation, I'd like for you just to raise your hand, raise it up high. Anybody, everybody, awesome. Anybody else? There's a bunch. That's pretty good. Praise the Lord. Father, I praise you for these that have heard the message. They've prayed that prayer. And according to Romans chapter 10, verse 13, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. At this moment, they are. And your spirit will give them peace and grace. Now I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do what Jesus said, to acknowledge him. The way we do that is you just stand up right where you are. You don't come forward. You don't go back. You don't sign anything. But you're just saying, I pray that prayer. And this day marks the beginning of my life in Christ. I want you to stand up now, all you who raise your hands, and stand up and remain standing with me. Excellent. Excellent. Keep standing. Keep standing. Now while you're standing, keep standing because our orange shirts are going to give you a New Believer's New Testament. So keep standing. And in fact, keep standing there for a moment and, until they give you one. Even if you have a Bible, take this one. I'll explain why. As they give those Bibles out, you believers who've been praying and hoping, would you look around and see all these new folks in the kingdom of heaven and let them know what you think? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Excellent. Now, as you have that New Believer's New Testament, it's sort of a study Bible itself. It's more of a topical thing, but it covers what the, Bible, the New Testament says about Bible, prayer, the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, you know, Satan, angels, heaven, hell, all of that. So you can read that and learn a lot. In there, write down, this Bible was given to you by CBC on the occasion of, and just put, my salvation. This was the day that you look back to, September the 15th, 2013, and wherever you go in your life, whenever anybody says, when did you commit your life to Jesus? You can say, I stood up for Jesus that day, and I know that, and it changed my life. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Now. Next week, we're studying our shapes. So remember, go to communitybible.com, take the spiritual gifts test, and find out who you are and the way God wired you, and we'll help you understand it next week. Have a blessed week, and tell someone the good news. Thanks.